Hello, and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this arbitration conversation, we're going to talk about arbitration and access to justice and how access to justice really is an important issue when it comes to arbitration. We talk a lot about efficiency in arbitration, but you can create procedures that actually do enhance and expand access to justice. And today we have a leader in the field um, who has a really awesome international background, um, has edited a book on access to justice and arbitration that I participated in, um, really up and coming and doing interesting work. So I'm really glad to have him here. It is um, Professor Leonardo Oliveira. He is a lawyer. He was from Brazil, having graduated and passed the Brazilian bar exam. But then he worked in many different parts of the world and ended up in London. And now he is um, in London as a lecturer in law. And um, he also is at the law school and Anglia Ruskin University and a sub supervisor for not, paper nine in the Department of Land Economy at University of Cambridge. And I'm sure I completely muddled that background. So um, Leonardo, first of all, um, thank you so much. And um, it's great having you with us for this conversation. Well, thank you, Angie. Happy to be here. Hope I can be helpful and uh, we can have a I mean, I'm sure with you, I'll have a very good conversation. <laughs> well, for starters, you know, because I did sort of muddle the background, but um, but but it would be really interesting because a lot of young lawyers um, throughout the world kind of wonder how does one end up teaching law in London, having been a lawyer in Brazil. So I always think it's fun just to hear about your journey and how you became um, a professor in London after being a lawyer in Brazil. It, um, I mean, I always, when people ask me why, why you decide to go into academia, I sometimes like to quote George Bernard Shaw that he says, those who can do, those who can teach, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not necessarily that. It was, um, it was one thing that led to another. It was such you, I worked in Brazil in the public sector in private firms. And I say just to the students, I was in a middle sized firm with 15 lawyers and I moved to a bigger one. We had 150 lawyers. So beginning of the last decade, which it's not called the noughties, I find it weird to call it the noughties. But the, the, it was a, uh, the beginning was a big firm for Brazil. Now firms in Brazil are much bigger with 500, 600 lawyers. But I wanted to have that experience of, uh, believe it or not, being backstabbed, <laughs> the, the whole billable hours thing and so on and so forth. And after a while, I did some postgraduate courses in Brazil and I decided to study a little bit more. So I decided to do an LLM in the UK in international trade law. And when that led to a PhD, that eventually led to uh, my first uh, lecture position at Nebraska University. So it was like a, one thing led to another. Of course, I mean, there's a personal reasons, right? I ended up get, getting married here and I have a son and then I'm settled here. But the, there's an expression where I originally come from, right? That says, I, I feel like I parachuted into academia. <laughs> That's how I ended up in academia. <laughs> right, well, and then at the same time, of course, you became interested in arbitration as one of your areas of specialty. And, and even more particularly in terms of access to justice and the project you worked on. Maybe you wanna share with us a little bit about the project um, and how that came to be. Well, I think this was a development of my PhD in a way, and some things that I faced when I practiced law. Uh, when I practiced law, I did a lot of uh, litigation small claim courts, and it was something very big in Brazil at the time, and there was a lot of discussion about access to justice in, uh, in that sense, because um, in Brazil, up to a certain amount, uh, it's free for you to start a claim in small claim courts. So that was a big step for access to justice. And my PhD was about arbitrability, where I did a comparative study of arbitrability in English law and Brazilian law. And it has to do with something funny also that uh, uh, happened when I was in Brazil. The Guggenheim Foundation wanted to establish a Guggenheim Museum in Rio de Janeiro, where I originally, I originally, uh, I originally come from. And they couldn't do this because the, uh, there was a clause establishing that New York law would be applicable. And there were some issues of uh, uh, public finance that were uh, prerogative of the state. So they decided that's not arbitrable. That kind of triggered this idea, okay, let's compare it. 
And then I have to make a, an observation here. When we talk arbitrability, we're looking at the European view, not the US view, because um, the US view, uh, going back to, if I'm pronouncing correctly, it's a Kaplan and um, I'm trying to remember Chicago or something. Sorry if I'm mixing up the name of the case. Oh, no, uh, you're fine. Chicago yeah. Options and Kaplan. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. trying to remember. Yeah. Because it was one of the, the cases that I used. I remember that, that they were discussing if, ah, uh, did the parties agree to submit X, Z dispute to arbitration or not? And uh, not the discussion if the dispute in itself is arbitrable. So, but that was my PhD. And from that, I moved to access to justice because I started to think, okay, what disputes can be submitted to arbitration was a discussion that I was having at the time in a sense that arbitration is expanding to disputes that were not originally submitted to arbitration. But then right. generates another problem is that, okay, are we guaranteeing access to justice in different disputes? And then, of course, I mean, we, when I thought about it, I would jump directly to, oh, consumers and employees. But it's not just consumer and employees. I mean, you have athletes also uh, that uh, submit their disputes to the Port of Arbitration Sports in Lausanne, and there's a bit of discussion of that. And you have different uh, B2B contracts, uh, as I normally tell my students when I teach um, contract law. I think uh, there is a, uh, a difference between, which I use an example uh, very common in, in Europe, a contract between the owner of a kebab shop and Coca-Cola. You still have a huge <laughs> disparity of power there, although it's right. a B2B contract. And then I say, well, when you see Coca-Cola and McDonald's, it's quite uh, even in terms of uh, power there, but the, uh, uh, let's say, Coca-Cola and uh, kebab shop owner, there's a huge uh, uh, discrepancy in power there. And, well, and it brings you, up sorry. a lot of these different areas. You know, it's interesting when you talk about um, arbitrability and this question, you know, coming from first options, but then how it's really become so interesting from a comparative perspective because the law is so different if you are in Europe versus the US when you talk about things like arbitrability, because there are things that we arbitrate on a daily basis here under US law that would not be arbitrable in Europe. Um, and I'm sure you've really seen this firsthand. Um, and then of course, when you compare it with the South American perspective, and now we also see with the Canadian perspective, um, it's, it's really interesting to see these comparative questions. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Is there an answer? I mean, how do we, what is the best way? I guess, what's the solution? Because you're right, um, these are a lot of areas where we have power differentials, and that's really the question. Um, I don't know, what do you think? You know, if, if in a perfect world, what do you see as, as the solution? I, I'm trying to open a discussion, right, and, uh, about this. Uh, I think there will be not saying arbitration is bad. The contrary, I think arbitration can be very useful. Yeah. I try to come up with, a, a, you might even think, silly examples, right? I don't think uh, just because it's a consumer dispute, it's it shouldn't be arbitrated or there is inequality. Because I, I think some consumers might want confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And that, I thought a lot about that uh, when I, funny enough, right? seen some of uh, the celebrities in the US when they go to court, some of the stuff that they say or they try to say. I mean, recently, I picked that up with um, uh, the claims that they did, uh, the people that uh, were saying that the election was uh, triggered. And now there is a lawsuit by, I forgot the name of the company that uh, provided the machine. And they, their defense is not a reasonable person would think about that, that what I said is was uh, real. And then I started to think they might prefer their disputes to be submitted to arbitration because they don't want this to be in public. I'm not trying to defend them, but I also thought, imagine if you're an influencer and you have a certain image, but then in your private life, you like to buy certain products that they do not reflect that image that you like to sell. You might want that dispute to be arbitrated. This is one position. But then there's the other position, which you push arbitration into consumers to actually uh, stop them from triggering a dispute to make it harder for them to have access to justice. So that is when you have to figure out how do we strike this balance? Um, mm -hmm. What I was trying to advocate is that I think when you have, like I said, the big players, McDonald's and Coca-Cola, they know what they're getting into. It's quite clear, they're well represented and so on and so forth. But sometimes if you have someone that, 
uh, does not understand really well what's happening. And suddenly uh, it's uh, like, like I said, they use the same term, parachutes into a, uh, an arbitration and doesn't know, doesn't understand what this is about or what does it mean and so on and so forth. That's very dangerous. And I, I, mean, uh, I quote a lot about pop culture or trivial things, but there was an example, and that this, uh, I saw that show, The Good Wife, that was really funny because my wife and I were watching this and she, she was the first time that she said, oh, so this is what you study? And I said, yes, because it was an exactly case like this, an employee that uh, the contract and arbitration clause and the dispute was ridiculous. You had uh, the arbitrator, um, a representative of the employer, and there was no proper hearing. So they, they were just saying, no, you stole from us, and therefore uh, you were fired. It was a, a fair dismissal and so on and so forth. And in that case, because the lawyers in the firm were doing pro bono service, what happened was that the, they, they talked about the arbitrability, right? What kind of disputes were submitted or not? And tort claims were not submitted, uh, were not written in that clause. So they got away with that and took the, the claim to court. But I, when I saw this, and I was I said, my wife that is not in the legal area, she said, this is really strange. And I said, yeah, it's not supposed to be like that. <laughs> No, <laughs> but it's funny though, when you have these incidents on TV and you kind of, you know, have to cringe a little bit because it's often not really accurate, but, but it does raise, you know, good issues. And, and, and the truth is, you know, kind of getting, digging a little bit more deeply when we talk about, um, you know, I agree. I don't think we can say all arbitration is bad for consumers. It can actually be good for consumers in particular cases. Um, and it's very contextual. Um, one question that comes up is maybe the real concern isn't whether something should be arbitrable, but how it's arbitrated, right? So the procedures yeah. that are used, um, you know, one area that's near and dear to my heart is the idea of using technology to make it cheaper and easier. Um, I don't know, do you have any thoughts with respect to online arbitration as helping to lower the barriers to entry? I think that uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's inevitable, right, that we will get to that. It's, uh, I, it's, we do everything on our mobile now. And, and that um, uh, one of our, our colleagues also contributed to the book, Mirezi, that said, everything is done online. Why can't we have justice online? Mm -hmm. She said that, and I thought, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we just have to make sure, because I think uh, if you talk to arbitrators, people dealing with arbitrator about uh, video depositions and things like that, they always talk about like, oh, you have to make sure that someone is there because there's not someone behind a camera lifting some right, uh, right. cue card saying, answer this, answer that. So <laughs> that is something that had to be considered, I think, depends if you're working with a consumer and everything. But I believe that people will be uh, quite keen to use technology. My, um, my only concern is that we have different legal cultures, right? And uh, uh, I don't think we can standardize everything. So if you're in a common law system where it's very adversarial, perhaps having that hearing is very important for the person uh, litigating. Whereas if you're in a civil law country, people are used to the fact that uh, it's written base and so on and so forth. They might not mind that the whole process is a uh, documents only, but I'm not saying that this should be absolute. This should, it's a complicated uh, assessment because when you look at culture, mm -hmm. it, it, we're stepping aside from law and trying to figure out how people behave. I'll leave this to the psychologists. <laughs> you know, though, honestly, I mean, one area that I have actually researched and written about um, contracting culture and dispute resolution culture, I mean, I think it's a really important point and it's something that we should consider when we're assessing um, a dispute resolution procedure and arbitration, you know, which also kind of brings us to yet another kind of safety net, which is the use of unconscionability. Um, unconscionability as a contract defense can sometimes help to police fairness of arbitration. Um, I know you and I both looked at that in, in several different venues. Um, maybe you want to speak to your views on the use of unconscionability. Is it overused? Is it being used appropriately or is it underused? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I have to say, I, I, I side with you because I read your work and I actually really liked the one about the safety net. There was something very interesting when you presented the views 
And then I agree a lot when it's, um, you look at the opposing views of this through the economic analysis of the law. Mm -hmm. And there I thought it was really interesting because yes, I agree with the economic analysis of the law about efficiency. We, we cannot have, and then when I teach students, I say this to them, you, you're not going to go to a mobile shop, I mean, in the, what is it, at and in the US or Verizon or something like this, and sit down with the sales assistant and say, all right, let's discuss the clauses in the contract. What is the forum clause? Is there an entire agreement clause? <laughs> is there, you're not going to do that, right? This makes no sense, right? But uh, this view that efficiency should be uh, written in stone, and I think you presented that, I mean, that I, uh, the sole purpose of the contract is not just to be efficient. And I really like that idea because yes, it's not. Efficiency is one part of the contract, but fairness is also another part of the contract. Yeah. Because otherwise we can go back to, yes, I, I cited at this uh, in a chapter that I wrote uh, about the Merchant of Venice, right? We go back to Merchant of Venice. Oh yes, the contract is written, it's efficient. So go and cut part of Antonio to get payment. So, <laughs> no, it's not like that. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. No, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you know what I think, um, you know, more to come, I think um, there's a lot more to explore when it comes to these questions looming at the context, you know, when we think about arbitration and um, that battle, efficiency versus fairness and sort of dancing the line um, to find the proper, um, the proper compromise of the two. Um, and also I think, you know, it's for young arbitrators out there and individuals who are going to be representing parties in arbitration to have that mindset of thinking, okay, how can we use this procedure in a way and participate in it in a way that guards access to justice as well as efficiency. And I think often it's, it's really a balancing act. So, um, so I really thank you for your contributions to the field. I thank you for the book. I thank you for this conversation. So thank you, Leonardo. And I look forward to further conversations. Uh, thank you, Emmy. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs>